الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاب شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون وعن ابن عباس رضي الله عن قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حق الولد على الوالد أن يحسن اسمه ويحسن أدبه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويكثر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفتح قولي رب زدني علما بسبتوا علماء إكرام Elders, brothers, mothers and sisters in Islam Indeed it's a huge blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of us that He made us human beings in the best of all the creations Allah could have made us from the animals in the jungles from the fishes in the oceans from the birds in the sky from the insects crawling on this earth or from any one of the thousands of creations of Allah but without asking, without filing a request Allah made us the most intelligent of His creation the most beautiful of His creation for this we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Another great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of us sitting here He gave us this kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah in the lap of our mothers without any sacrifice, without any request If you think for a moment there are hundreds of people who die in every minute in different corners of the world They are transferred to the hereafter Majority of them don't believe in Allah and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And if they die in such a state this is our understanding they are going to burn in hell for eternity They are unsuccessful forever and forever. Likewise, hundreds of babies are born in every minute in different corners of the world. Though the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that if every newborn is born on nature, on clarity, fitrah, and that is Islam. But it is the parents that make him a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshipper. Allah knows best how long they're going to live in this world without this ni'mat and bounty of Islam. For this also we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We hear the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the sacrifices of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that gives us an idea of what price they had to pay, what price they had to pay because of accepting the da'wat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam including myself first of all, we underestimate this ni'mat of Islam today We go to school, we go to colleges that are job places In the neighborhood that we live, once in a while shaitan puts these thoughts in our mind, it crosses our mind And we ask this question to ourselves, are we on the right path or not? Are these people better than us or are we better than us? They are allowed to hang out, they are allowed to wine and dine and have fun and have friends in the opposite gender But our life is so limited, there are so many constraints So are we on the right path or are they on the right path? So my respected elders and brothers, the reason for this behind this is we don't know the value of deen. We don't know the value of iman. To understand this, we have to look into the sacrifices of the Sahaba of the Allah anhum, their life of luxury before Islam, and how eventually it changed after Islam. Musa ibn Umar of the Allah an, a person who used to wear one suit of his used to be 200 dirham silver coins, 200 dirhams more than 200 dollars of today. When he used to pass, pass by a street or an alley, the fragrance that he used would leave, would leave such a trail in the alley, in the avenue, in the streets that people coming after him would know that Musa ibn Umar had passed by, by, by this place. A person whose life was so luxurious, but when he died, he did not have, have enough kafan also to cover his entire body. If it was pulled towards the head, the feet would become bare. If it was pulled towards the feet, the head would be bare. And eventually then leaves were placed on a certain part of the body. Bilal radiallahu an, once Umar radiallahu an, in his khilafah, when he was the khalifa, was sitting on his cushion or whatever place he used to sit on, he saw Bilal radiallahu an coming from the opposite side. He told the people to make place for him. And he said, when Bilal radiallahu an approached him, he said, Bilal, there are two people on the face of this earth who, des who deserve to sit on my cushion. 
who deserve to sit on my seat. Bilal radiallahu anhu understood what he meant. He said, O oh, oh, Khalifa, Umar radiallahu anhu, who is the other person? He said, one is you and one is Khabbab ibn Arath radiallahu anhu. According to one narration, Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu. These three were among the Sahaba who gave the most sacrifices for them. So Bilal radiallahu anhu said, as we say in today's language, that Khabbab had connections. Oh, so I'm sorry, forgive me. Khabbab radiallahu anhu was coming. It wasn't Bilal radiallahu anhu. So Khabbab radiallahu anhu said, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Bilal had connections. He was bought out of slavery by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, but I had no relatives, no people to worry for me. I stayed in slavery and gave most sacrifices as compared to Bilal radiallahu anhu. And now this is not a person, a regular Khalifa, a person who rules on 2.2 million square miles of earth. A person when an earthquake comes, he lashes on the earth and says, didn't I do justice on you? A person of such a caliber. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ كَانَ بَعْدِي نَبِيٌّ لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ If there had been any prophet after me, it would have been Umar radiallahu anhu. He is saying to Khabbab that you deserve to sit on my cushion. So when Khabbab said, I was the one who gave the most sacrifices for deen, so Umar radiallahu anhu said, tell us what sacrifices you gave for deen. So Khabbab radiallahu anhu said, pick up my tamiz, pick up my shirt from the back. His shirt was picked up and there were huge holes of scars in his back. How did it happen? He said, a fire was burned. I was thrown in the fire. People would stand with their feet on my chest or would place their feet on my chest or would place a huge stone on my chest and because of the blood and fat of my back, the fire would extinguish. Okay. Why was this treatment? Just because of saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So these people had the value of Islam in their lives. Not to criticize anyone, I'm saying first of all for myself. If my, uh, my children break a glass in the house, or drop a plate in the house, or destroy something in the house, the, my heart would burn and have sorrow on that much more than my children leaving salah for one, one time. My children not reciting the dua when entering the house. My, my children not, not acting in an Islamic way. Why is such? Because though we are not saying by our tongue, but our actions prove that the value of deen is less than a plate and a glass in front of us. Nobody needs to point fingers to us. This is for us, for me and you to realize. So my respected elders and brothers, this is a huge ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is the key to success. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is the key to success in this world also and in the hereafter also. So we should all be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. Another great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of us, He made us in the Ummah, the nation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last nation to come on the face of this earth, but the first nation to enter Jannah on the Day of Judgment. For this also we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And coming on the topic, as parents, what are the responsibilities upon us regarding our kids? What are the claims they have upon us? What are the rights they have upon us? What are the challenges we face in this time and age and in this country where we are living today? And what are the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us? So I'll just inshallah a few challenges that as parents we face in this country, I'll just count them. And as much as the time frame allows us, inshallah we'll elaborate on that also. The biggest challenge that me and you face as far as living in this country is concerned, being parents, we are not able to give the love and quality time that we should give to our kids and what they deserve from us. Either it's because of ignorance or either it's because unintentionally we don't realize that what is their rights, how much time on daily basis we should give to our kids, on weekly basis, on monthly basis, how should be our relationship with them, of a friend, of a parent, of a child, and how much openness should be there, how much trust should be there. This is the biggest challenge that me and you face as parents. The second challenge that me and you face in this country is that we do care about the academic education of our children, but we don't pay attention on the religious upbringing of our children. Should these two things be side by side, or would, should one thing be much higher and given prior, given priority as compared to the other thing? The third challenge that we face is what company are we providing to our kids? The circles of the circle of friends that they sit in. The time that they spend on the internet, in front of the TV, playing Xboxes and different things and games. 
Are they allowed to sit at a certain age in front of these things? How are they allowed to spend their time? This is where parental control comes in. The third challenge. The fourth challenge is what type of books they study. We were just mentioning Ulama, what we were talking yesterday. Akar Guzari came in front of us. A young boy, I'm not taking name of the school, I'm not taking name of the place. A young boy who was in an Islamic school since pre K is still in an Islamic school, has not graduated from high school yet. Just because of reading certain books in the library of that Islamic school became an apostate. He left Islam Bhumatar Bhogya. Musliman ka bachcha hai, pre k se Islamic school ke andar pad raha hai, Islamic school hi ki library ke andar aisi kitabe padi ke Islam ko usne chhod kiya. Alhamdulillah, the teachers did an effort upon him and he returned back to Islam, Alhamdulillah. But what books are they reading? As teachers, as people in the field of education, as people who run Islamic schools, as people who, as me and you as parents, what what we, are we keeping an eye that whatever books they are reading when they go to the library what do what they are doing in their free time this is another challenge another challenge in this country is eating halal providing halal food and halal sustenance to our kids after that another thing is when a child grows up boy or girl they reach the age of getting married are we getting them married and, found and finding appropriate spouses for them at the appropriate time, at the appropriate age. This is one of the biggest challenges that me and you face and the mentality that parents have that the child will become a child first, he will be able to do his study, he will be able to do his study, he will be able to do his study. Most probably this topic was elaborately covered by Mufti Sahib this last Saturday. But just to mention this is a very, very significant challenge that me and you are facing while living in this country. Starting from how much time we spend with our kids. Just to give you a car gozari you might have heard before, a teacher in an Islamic school, a mother, has her own, had her own kid, own kids. She gave, she was an elementary school teacher, she gave an assignment. Write a an article or an essay that what do you want to be? What do you want the environment around you to be like? So a boy wrote an article, an essay, and the mother, the teacher came back home and she was checking her, the, the homework that the kids did and after reading one of the essays, tears rolled down her eyes. So the husband came in, what's wrong? I'm reading one of the essays, the assignments that I gave to my elementary school students, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and they have written an essay and one essay is so emotional that I cannot take it. You go ahead and read it. By and large, the summary of that essay was, the husband read, the child said, Oh Allah, I make dua to you that make me like the TV in the house. Oh Allah, make me such for one day or two days that I become like a TV in the house. Why? Because I want my father to give attention to me. When he comes tired from work, I want him to still ask me how was my day. He sit for me, with me for a few minutes. My mom is upset because of a hard job day, uh, she had a hard day, day on her job, still I want to see her love and her affection. I want my brothers and sisters to fight for spending time for me. I want to be like a TV because when the TV comes on, the entire house leaves everything and sits straight and attentive in front of the TV. They give the full attention to the TV. Nobody talks when the program is going on. Nobody even pays attention to his food when they are looking at the TV or, on, or the internet or the video games or whatever. So I want to be like this, make me like this so I can get full attention. The father said, poor kid, kid and horrible parents. They don't give attention to their kids. The teacher, the mother said, he is our child, this is our kid. And he has written this essay. So my respected elders and brothers ask, I should ask whether we are imams, whether we are engineers and doctors or academics or lawyers or teachers, how much quality time are we giving to our kids? When they come to school, when, when we pick them up from madrasa or from school, or when we return back from our jobs, have we made it a habit to ask them, how was your day? No, this does not mean so much to us. This might not mean so much to them also because it, was, it will lose value after a few days. The same repetition, how was your day? What did you do? What did you learn in school? But it carries weight. My father cares for me. My father is paying attention for me. Anything wrong at the job? Anything wrong at the school? How was your day? Different things we can think of and we can ask. 
them and let them feel the trust and the affection that they require for them. Ahnaf rahimahullah, a great scholar among the Tabi'eens. Sahaba radiallahu an used to do mashwara with him. Muawiyah radiallahu an is not a, a regular Sahabi, a Sahabi of the highest caliber, one of the scribes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He complained about his son Yazid to Ahnaf, so that he doesn't listen to me or whatever the complaint was. What was the reply of Ahnaf, more or less to the nearest meaning in English? He said the parents are like a shade providing sky and a soft earth for the children. The parents are like a shade providing sky and soft earth for the children. Okay, whatever they need from you, grant them. As long as it's within the boundaries of Islam. If they are sad, lighten them up, refresh them up, make them happy. Don't be so harsh on them that they begin to hate you and they pay for and they pray for deliverance from you. اتنی سختی بچوں پر مت کرو کہ تم سے نفرت کرنا شروع کر دیں اور یہ دعا کریں کہ اللہ ہمارے ماں باپ سے ہمیں چھٹکارا دے دیں جو اس زمانے کے اندر کون رائے دے رہا ہے احمد رحمہ اللہ رائے دے رہے ہیں معاویہ رضی اللہ عنہ سم ٹائمس ڈونٹ گیٹ می رانگ سم ٹائمس وی تھنک اینڈ وی ٹیل آر چلڈرن آلسو ہمیں تو ہمارے ماں باپ ایک مارتے تھے اور ہم جو ہے ٹائم کے بیٹھ جاتے تھے ہمیں ماں باپ ایک دفعہ کچھ کہتے تھے اور ہم بات سن لیتے تھے تم بات کو نہیں سنتے ہو Our, 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 our parents used to smack us once and that's it, we would never repeat that thing again. They would say once to us, they would yell at us, yell at us and we would follow them and what, what type of kids you are that you don't listen to us. My friends and brothers, this is not helping us. This is not helping them. We are not back in our countries, the environment was different, the mizaj was different. Still it is different there. Yes, it's a totally different environment. We need to learn we need to learn how to bring up our children in this environment where we are living. And to and I'm not saying you know, once in a while this is needed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has clearly mentioned in the ahadith ki bachcha jab saat saal ka ho to kya karna hai, dhas saal ka ho to kya karna hai. I'm not denying this fact. I'm saying to take it as an only way of bringing your children on the right track, this mentality is wrong. And the best, best way to understand this is at our job places, our superiors, our managers, or when we are students, our teachers, if they, if we do something wrong, grown-ups, we do something wrong and they smack us, how would we feel? So put the children in your shoes. And if they do something wrong and you just smack them, and you tell them, okay, you don't listen to us and we were your age and we used to listen to our parents, is it benefiting them or are they much going much far away from you? So these are the things, that give one of the greatest challenges as parents we face in this country. Moving forward, another challenge is that how much knowledge are we providing them? Religious education, religious upbringing. If you are not spending quality time with them, if you are not providing them with a good environment, the environment of the masjid, the environment of the scholars, the environment of religious people, my respected elders and brothers, they will be cultured and nurtured by peer pressure. They will be cultured and nurtured by the internet and the immorality that is out there on the internet and in, front, uh, in the TV and in the videos. If we are not giving them quality time and quality environment, then they will be nurtured by whatever is out there. Then we can't blame them that we are not giving them that environment, so they have to get that environment from somewhere. Okay? They have to fill up the vacuum that is out there. So eventually the kids in the school, the company of the college, the, what they are seeing on the internet and on the TV, this will upbring them and bring and bring and develop their character and develop their qualities, good or bad. Once a father came to Umar and complained about his son. The son was called. And Umar scolded the son, reprimanded him, and when he was done, the son asked, Are there any rights? of my father upon me, is there any claim that I can claim from my father that these are my rights, my rights? Mama Pune ke naate, hum kehte hai Imam Sahib, joh ulama aate hai, hum ko kehte hai ki aap bachchon ko waldein ki hukuk batayin ki waldein ki kya hukuk hote hai. Hum ee nii zahin mein aata ki hum kabhi ye bhi sikhe ulama se ki humare kya hukuk hai waldein, bachchon ke kya hukuk hai humare hukuk. Many a times we tell our ulama that give speeches on the rights of the parents so our kids learn something. How many times have we gone to the ulama and asked them what are the rights of our children upon us? 
For every action there is a reaction, my respected elders and brothers. If we don't provide them what they deserve, they will not provide us with what we deserve in our old age. If we are good and caring for them when they are young, they will be good and caring for us when we are old. If we don't give them what they deserve, we, cannot, we should not even expect this. So the Umar scolded the son, and then the son, the, and then the son asked, Are there any rights that my father should have fulfilled regarding me? Umar said, Yes, there are rights. And he mentioned three rights. You might have heard this many times before also. One of the rights he mentioned was, that Your father should have chosen a good mother for you. Second, your father should have given you a good name. Third, your father should have teach, taught you Quran and the knowledge of the Quran. So the boy said, my father did not choose a good mother for me. As, as youngsters or as grown-ups, when we choose our spouses, what do we? what is the defining factor that we have in us? Again, this is a topic that has, mashallah, many times been covered by Mufi Sahib in this month. What, what, what is the criteria that we cover, that we have in mind? Is it religiousness? Is it piety or is it just physical beauty? Or is it just the noble lineage? Or is it just the wealth of the family of the spouse? If religiousness and piety is made the defining factor when we get married and when we get our sons and daughters married, eventually this problem will be solved. So the, the son said, he did not choose a good mother for me. My, my mother was a slave of a fire worshipper. Second right, he gave you a good name, he named me Jual, which means um, ugly in English. He did not give me a good name. Third, did he teach me the, the knowledge of the Quran or the Quran itself? My father did not teach me Quran nor the knowledge of the Quran. So the father, Umar turned his face towards the father and he said, Isme koi nahi hai. Tumne hi apne ko apne There is no mistake or there is no punishment or there is no accountability on the child. It is you who have made your son rebel against you. So my respected elders and brothers, providing them with a good environment. Not to criticize anyone. When it's the time for, the, for the, our boys and girls to come to, for our youngsters to come to the masjid, we don't bring them to the masjid. And when they are old enough, they, do this, they don't come to the masjid. Then we say, why Imam Sahib, our kids don't come to the masjid, do something to bring them. The initial responsibility is not of the scholar and the Imam of the masjid, the initial responsibility is the parents. The parents have given birth to the children. Imam Sahib has not given birth to the children. They, they spend more time. How much time can they spend in the masjid? How much time can they listen to the Imam Sahib? They would get bored after 30 or 40 minutes. Every day, three or three times, four or three times a day, it's not possible. They have their own, they have their own responsibilities, school, college and all these things. Okay, so most time they spend with is with the parents. So the initial responsibility of the parents to bring them to the masjid, to train them, to culture them, and to provide them with a good environment automatically when they will grow up they will come to the masjid, we don't need to tell them so providing with a quality environment with a religious environment and a religious upbringing this is one of the greatest challenges that we face in this country moving forward what type of friends are youngsters this is something for the youngsters also and for the elders also what type of circles are kids sit with we just give them clo or rooms we give, we, we give them their separate computers at an age that should, that should not be granted to them. They have their own TV, they have their own gadgets. Close the room, the whole night they are doing, we don't even know. So when they are giving them so much openness at such a young age, what can we expect from them? So there has to be certain level of parental control that we should go to the ulama and ask them, what is the age that I should do this and what's beyond this age and what's beyond this level? Everything is in deen for us. Allah has given us such a beautiful deen that the entire life from childbirth till death has been given to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What we don't find in his life, we find in the life of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the tabi'een and the tabi'een. So these are the things that as parents we need to learn. What does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Al-mar'u ala deen khalili fal yanzu man yukhali au kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam a person is on the religion of his friends. This is a very heavy statement. A person is on, is on the religion of his friends. So you should make sure that whom are you sitting with? What type of company are you acquiring? What type of friends are you sitting with? With whom are you intermingling? Just in our Pakistan, it's here also. But back in our countries, when the rishta was going to be a rishta, 
तो उस वक्त कहते हैं कि भाई देखो कि इसकी कंपनी कैसी है किन लोगों के अंदर ये बैठता है इसके दोस्त कौन है फिर पता चल जाएगा किस किस्म का इसका मिजाज है वेन पीपल वेन प्रपोज कम फ्रॉम मैरिज और वेन वेन समी वॉन्ट टू गेट इज बॉय और गर्ल मैरिज एंड प्रपोजल इज ऑफ द ऑपोजिट साइड विच ही कैन लुक दैट वॉट इज द कंपनी ऑफ दैट of that boy where does he sit where does he spend his time so a person is recognized by his company you might be t- walking with your friends you might be a religious person you might be coming to the masjid by but but by the way your friends are dressed on the street by the way they are acting in vulgarity or obscenity on the street people will think that you are also such because you are within them so we should really be careful from any spot that might put a blemish upon us that he is not an appropriate muslim especially for the youngsters and for the elders also rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in i'tikaf the last 10 days of ramadan in masjid nabawi the prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of his wives radhiyallahu anha came to see him rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw two people coming from the opposite side sahaba radhiyallahu anhu he stopped them and so his wife can come I'm sorry. Wife came to me. He was seeing her off. Went to the door to see her off. Two people were coming from the opposite side. He stopped them and told them to wait. His wife left. Then they were allowed to come. They did not ask anything. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This said this was what wife so and so of the Allah Ta'ala. The ulama while elaborating on this hadith, they say what was the reason? Would the Sahaba have bad thoughts about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Now is it not? That he, in other words, forgive me for using this language. That he is hanging out with a strange woman in Ramadan, in Masjid Al Nabawi, in the last ten days of Ramadan, in a state of ertikaf. This was impossible. This even this thought to cross from the in the across across the minds of the Sahaba of the Allah Hanum. This was impossible. But still, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave the lesson to this ummah that hamisha tohmat ki jaroon se apne aap ko bachao. Always secure yourself from any spot that people might see you in that company and in that spot, and might have a negative image about you. Though might you, though you might not be involved in that specific thing. So this tells us as youngsters and elders to make sure whom we are sitting with, whom we are befriending. Our Sahaba of the Allah, our Nabi, our Rasulullah, our Allah, our Ali, our Sallam. So who are the best of your friends? Which company is the best company? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave three qualities. Man zakkarakum billahi ru'yatuhu. When you see that person who reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa zada fi ilmikum mantiquhu. When that person speaks, your knowledge in deen increases. Wa zakkarakum bil akhirati amaluhu. When you see his actions, when you see his salah, when you see his life, it reminds you of the hereafter. That is the friend you should be friend, that is the company you should sit in. Sometimes youngsters they complain okay? that भाई हमारा दो बहुत बड़ा सर्कल नहीं है बहुत सारे दोस्त नहीं है वालदेन बाहर जाने नहीं देते तो यंगस्टर्स कंप्लेन यू डोंट हैव अ बिग सर्कल द प्रॉब्लम दैट वी हैव समटाइम्स इट्स रियली डिफिकल्ट टू मेक श्योर टू यूज द अप्रोप्रिएट लैंग्वेज नॉट टू गेट इन ट्रेवल इन दिस कंट्री सो मेनी प्रॉब्लम आउट देर दिस यू कैन सी इट इज ईज फॉर मी फॉर सेंग दिस I have 500 friends on post Facebook. I have 1,000 friends. This is a craze that is going out there. You might not even know those people who they are, but this craze of increasing your circle of friendship is having a toll on our youngsters to such an extent that they are they are they are losing their piety also. They are losing their personality also. They are losing their identity also. We might have this complaint as youngsters that we don't have good, many friends. One or two friends, or three friends, or four friends, or we might not have any friends at all. My respected elders and brothers, having hundreds of friends who are immoral in their everyday life, who don't have any identity, whether they are Muslims or Christians or Jew or any religion they belong to, they don't have any identity. It's better than this that you should have no friends. At least you can secure your identity. At least you can secure your personality. So this is a basic thing to keep in mind for youngsters and elders. What company we are sitting in. Moving forward, providing halal sustenance to our youngsters and to our ourselves also, and to our youngsters also. My respected elders and brothers, the famous hadith you might have heard it many times. One morsel of haram that goes in a stomach. Forty days of the future consecutive ibadahs and du'as are not acceptable by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
Imam Zahabi rahimahullah has mentioned a, you know, has written a book by the name of Al Kabair and he has gathered all the major sins in that book. Seventy plus I think there was a program going on or still going on in this masjid regarding those the major sins. And when he mentions eating haram, a few ahadith and narrations he mentions. Uh, he says one of the one of the narrations of ahadith of the hadith that he mentions is that Shaitan when he when he leaves his associates, when he sends his associates to work, to do effort on different types of people, and he gets the Kal Ghazali that a young man has started coming to the deen, he has started coming to the masjid, he started praying five times salah, he's doing tahajjud also, he's going out in jamaat also, and he's doing the effort of deen also, he's doing the service in the masjid also. I'm just giving examples. These are not the words of the hadith. A person is coming near to deen, but his sustenance is haram. The morsels that are going in him is haram. Shaitan says, you don't need to worry about this person. Leave him alone. He himself has taken care of him. He can never do tarakti. He can never elevate him. Because haram is going in his stomach. So as for the elders and brothers, once again, I'm not to criticize anyone. We might be building masajids. We might be donating in the masajids. We might be donating in the Islamic institution. We might be doing public welfare. In Allah tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and does not accept anything but pure. What are we, in other words, are we kidding with Allah? Are we joking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we playing games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By giving in the field of Islam something that is not even accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That same thing is going in the stomach of our youngsters. How would they become Allah? How would they become Allah fearing Muslims? Okay. The regular excuse that is out there is, we are doing the sacrifice for our own kids. How are we, how are we going to sustain them? I expect the elders and brothers to eat less instead of eating three times a day. I understand it's easy for me to say, it's easy for you to listen. It's really difficult to understand and digest these things, but the fact is, if instead of eating three times a day, if we eat once a day, but if that's coming from halal, it will have a, have a huge effect. So the, the thing would be totally different. Okay? So this is an important thing to keep in mind. And sometimes, what is things that are apparent as haram? Haram, to sell haram, to, I mean, to do a haram business, dealing in interest, selling alcohol, selling haram stuff. This is apparent. Every Muslim understands whether he is a layman Muslim or whether he is a knowledgeable Muslim. But sometimes we are doing such harams that we don't even realize, beating the bushes as employees in the timing that our employers have given us. Getting false certificates issued from the masjid. Certificate Banado, people come to the administration, to the Imam Saab that I am a practicing Muslim in this community. When do you see him? Only in Eid Salah. You never saw him in the masjid. Forgive me, I'm an imam, I pass through these situations. You might also pass through these situations. How can you bear testimony upon that person who never saw him in the masjid? He only comes in each salah and he says, I'm a practicing Muslim. And you are giving testimony and gawahi about his good moral character. He is pushing the administration also. He is pushing the imam also. And when they don't listen to him, he goes outside and starts yelling at the people of the masjid. Kathi masjid hai. Musalman ka kaam karna ta isme kya burai hai. This is a lie, this is false testimony. And when Rasulullah used the word Shahadat al Zur, false testimony, he was lying, he was he was leaning like this and he stood up. He did not stand up on Ishaqu Billah to do shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not move on Uqukul Walidain to be disobedient on the he was counting the the major sins. So first was associating partners with Allah, disobedience of the parents, and when he said Shahadat al Sur, he repeated it three times and he sat straight. He became red. Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, we wish he would have stopped saying this thing. Such huge is this. So the purpose of mentioning this is, this is something off the topic, but it keeps interconnected in such a manner that many a times we do something wrong and we don't even realize. And based on that wrong, we earn something and that is haram for us to earn. If we are supposed to give 40 hours a week on our job and we gave 39 hours without the permission of our employee and without his consent and knowledge that one hour of ha earning or one hour of salary that we earned is haram for us. The same way pork is haram for us, the same way wine is haram for us. The ulama are here, you can ask them. 
So these are the small gunas, these are the small things that make our income haram or at least not haram, mixes the haram with our income and that haram income is going in our stomach also and nourishing our body also and nourishing the body of our youngsters also. Time is coming to an end. So a couple of things, inshallah, three, four minutes, I'll wrap up. Another thing is, it has, it has already been covered, but just for a minute, when our children grow up and they are at the age of getting married, time to choose the appropriate spouses for them. Just a few days ago, surely Imam Sahib would, have, would, receive, would, would be receiving these types of call, Mawana Shahid Allah would be receiving these types of call. A call came, a young boy, 21 years old, is in college, has his own job also to sustain himself, wants to get married. He said, I am I'm at such a point, I cannot control myself. Either I would end up in zina or do some other thing. Either I would take drugs, these were the words. Either I would take drugs to depress myself, to control myself, or either I would end up in zina. My parents are saying, complete your education first, stand on your feet, start a job, and then we are going to get you married. But his friends and and brothers, what type of zulm and oppression we are doing on our kids? The wife or the spouse that comes in the house, brings, it brings he or she brings his or her own sustenance with them. We are not providing anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us. It's not a degrees that provide us. If five people are eating in the house, lunch and dinner, if the sixth person comes in, how much would be the increase in the monthly expenditure? Ask yourself. If, if suits, if clothing are being bought once a month, once every two months, once every three months on Eid, and shoes are being bought for five members of the family, if a sixth member comes in, how much would be the increase in the monthly expenditure? This is where again is off the topic. And uh, that's why they said make your nikah simple. Make your nikah, make your marriage simple. The ulama have used these words. One of the great scholars of our past from the, from the subcontinent, Muhammad Masood ibn Dumani rahmatullah alayhi, in the commentary of his monumental book, Ma'arif al Hadith, under this hadith, in which he mentions this hadith that if a father does not marry his son on an appropriate age, and that son ends up in a sin, the father will also share the consequences of that sin. This is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the commentary of that sin, Mawana Manzoor al Nawani rahmatullah alayhi mentions these, mentions that this is our words, ke agar hum us saadgi ke saad apne bachon ki shari kare, jo aap sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ne hume sikhai hai, to shari karna itna asan ho jai, jaysay musulman ki rey jume ki namaz parna asan hai. If we get our sons and daughters married, in an Islamic way, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us to get married, then it would be easy to get them married as it's easy for every Muslim to go to the masjid and pray to our salah. Is it a burden? We have to plan from three days before? Then we have to pray for Jumu'ah? No. Such easy is the marriage. Including myself, we have made it difficult for us. What will people tell us? Amai naqqar jayegi maashirikyan. My elders and brothers, these people will not help us on the day of judgment. Those who are blaming us and because of them we are leaving our deen today, these people will not be of any help to us on the day of judgment. So once again, when our children come of age, whether boy or girl, especially in this environment and country we are living, it's very important to get them married. We should not look what they are earning or what we are earning. This should be from the both side, from both sides. Many a times it happens, cases come to us, the, parents, the boy's parents are ready to get him married, ready to sustain him also, sacrifice a little bit in the expenditure also. But the, but the family members of the girl say, He himself is not standing on his feet, he is still going to school, how is he going to sustain our daughter? So it has to be from both sides. The sacrifice, the qurbani and the mentality and the upbringing should be from both sides and then this thing would come to an end and then we will find the solution for to do this. So whatever was said and heard, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me also, you also and all of us the understanding of these things also and allow us to act upon these things also. Ameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdi. Nashidu an la ilaha illa wa ta'astaghfirullah. Inshallah, those three uh, students who have uh, finished another of the Quran, Inshallah, gifts will be handed out to them.
راہیل اقبال ذکری اور رحمان امتلال وشید امتلال وشید اس کو اس طرح کی سمجھ This has been given to them because they have finished the Nazir al-Khatam al-Bhattam. Make a special dua for them that now he is at the Mamma al-Bhattam. Inshallah, they finished Nazir al-Khatam. The second stage is that now they understand the Qur'an and they pass over the Mamma al-Bhattam. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار أما مسك في صغيرة كبيرة بناهك وعفما أمسك قولا فعلا سورة سيرة أخلاقا خلقا تريكة وزوسا الله عليه وسلم في اتباع نسيف فرما یا اللہ مسلمان پورے عالم میں جہاں جہاں آباد ہیں ان کی ایمانوں کی جانوں کی مالوں کی آبروں کی ملکوں کی حدود کی اپنے فضل و کرم سے حفاظت فرما ہم میں جتنے بیمار ہیں سب کو اپنی روحانی جسمانی بیماریوں سے شفاء کاملہ عادلہ نصیب فرما یا اللہ جتنے بھی روزگار ہیں سب کو حلال روزگار مہیا فرما جتنے قرضدار ہیں سب کے قرضوں اور غیر سے بندوبست فرما جتنے پریشان حال ہیں سب کی پریشانیوں کو دور فرما جس کی جو بھی نیک تمنا ہے اپنے فضل و کرم سے اس کو پورا فرما یا اللہ جنہوں نے دعاوں کی درخواست کی ہے دعاوں کی متوقتے ہیں اپنے فضل و کرم سے ان کے تمام مسائل کو حل فرما ہمارے اشتداروں میں سے دوستوں میں سے اساتذہ میں سے والدین میں سے جتنے بھی اس دنیا سے چلے گئے سب کی محفرت فرما کیوں اللہ تو ہماری قبروں کو بھی جنت کے باغوں میں سے باغ بنا جو ہم میں صاحب اولاد ہیں ان کی اولاد کو نیک اور سالے بنا یا اللہ جو بے اولاد ہیں ان کو نیک سالے اولاد عطا فرما جن کے حلال کاروبار ہیں ان میں برکت عطا فرما یا اللہ اس ملک میں ہماری اور ہماری آنے والی نسلوں کی ایمان کی حفاظت فرما یا اللہ ہم بھی مخلوق ہماری محنت بھی مخلوق ہم اپنے بچوں کی صحیح تربیت نہیں کر سکتے یا اللہ تو ہی ان کی تربیت فرما اور تو ہی ان کی حفاظت فرما دنیا میں بھی